quick welcome to Kate Quinn. We're so, so delighted to have you joining us here tonight. We're excited to talk with you about this amazing novel and the amazing Mila Pavlichenko. Um, just a couple of bookkeeping or sort of housekeeping I items as we go through the conversation as Jen and Kate are uh, having their discussion. We welcome your questions always and we invite you to put those questions in the chat and then I'll pop in um, to, to get those questions asked at, periodically throughout the discussion. Um, we also want to make sure to welcome some members. We have members from other book clubs that actually touched base with Jen because they had also selected the Diamond Eye for their book clubs. And we're so excited to be able to join us. Um, so of course, we would love to welcome everyone. So we're delighted to have those book clubs with us here tonight. Um, and I just wanna to say to those people and anyone joining us, the best way to sort of keep up with all of the Book Nation by Gem book clubs is to make sure you sign up on the Book Nation website and the mailing list. I'm going to pop those into the chat this evening too, so it'll make it easy for you to access. Um, all right. And so I would love to uh, introduce Jen Blankfein, the host and moderator of um, Book Nation by Jen and Kate Quinn, author of The Diamond Eye. We're um, delighted to have all of you here with us to talk about this wonderful novel. I'm gonna keep letting people in, but Jen, I pass it over to you to get started. Excellent, thank you so much, Louisa, for moderating and Kate for being here with us. We're very excited to have you and to hear about your book and to learn more about you too. So um, I think I'm just going to start by reading your bio and then we'll discuss everything, okay? Fantastic. All right, so Kate Quinn is the New York Times and USA Today bestselling author of historical fiction. A native of Southern California, she attended Boston University where she earned a bachelor's and master's degree in classical voice. She has written four novels in the Empress of Rome saga, and two books in the Italian Renaissance before turning to the 20th century with the Alice Network, Huntress, The Rose Code, and The Diamond Eye. All have been translated into multiple languages. Kate and her husband now live in San Diego with three rescue dogs. So welcome and uh, great to hear, read a little bit about you, but I have a few questions just about your bio and about you. Um, you have a degree in classical voice. So how did you end up becoming an author? Uh, really, it was the balance between my parents. Uh, my father was a classically trained, a, a classically trained musician who ended up becoming a professional jazz musician. And my mother is a, a librarian with a degree in ancient and medieval history. So the history, the books and the music were always uh, flying around at my home when I was growing up. I was very lucky that way. And so I ended up uh, going to school for opera. But at the same time, I was always writing books on the side. And eventually, uh, it just happened to be that the books were well, one out. Very interesting. I, I don't know if you know, but we have had um, the author Jennifer Rosner, The Yellow Bird Sings, who's actually a friend of mine from high school. She and is wonderful. I love that book. She, yeah, she, um, I asked her if she knew you and she said, of course, and that you've done events together and she sends her best wishes. She is also an opera singer and her father was a musician growing up. She had music. He, I think he was a violin player. So it's very interesting. You have similar kind of uh, backgrounds. Um, so I thought that was kind of fun. We've had her here at Book Nation before. Um, it says in your bio that you have three rescue dogs. Tell us a little about the dogs. <laughs> oh, uh, they are wonderful. They're my companions since I work at home alone all day, alone except for them. So I have three. I uh, have, they're all rescues. They're all black was not by design. I wasn't trying to color coordinate them, but we have a little bit of a thing for hard luck cases and black dogs have a hard time getting adopted. People think they look less friendly. So uh, we ended up with three black dogs. I've got one named Caesar and he lives up to the name. He believes he's ruler of all he surveys. I have Callie who is Calpurnia because Caesar and Calpurnia, my first love was ancient Rome. And we have Miles, who was our uh, 2020 pandemic dog that came into the family then, and who is a tripod. He only has three legs, but he gets around like a house on fire. He's great. Wow. 
That's that's very cool. Are they big or small? Uh, medium size. Uh, Caesar's a little smaller, but he does not comport himself like it. And uh, the other two are a little bigger, but uh, they definitely know who, who rolls the pack. Very nice. I'm all for black dogs. I have a black lab and I, I like black dogs. So that's good. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, now, I also I had heard that you are a Navy wife. Can you tell us about that? Uh, my husband's active duty Navy and has been for close to 16 years now. Um, so it means we move around a lot. But on the other hand, my job goes with me wherever I go. So that is not nearly the problem for me that it is for most uh, Navy spouses, because one of the things that's a little difficult for um, Navy spouses is having to restart your career every few years if you're the spouse and you have to keep moving when your um, active duty military member does. But fortunately, yeah, we do not have that issue since I'm pretty much in business with a laptop and an internet connection. Mm -hmm. And where were you before San Diego? Um, before San Diego, that was uh, Maryland. We were in the, we're actually a little town out, we're, we're in Crofton, which is not far from Annapolis. So we've done a fair amount of moving. Wow. So your, your writing must really ground you. At least you always have that with you. Yes, it, it's always something that, you know, I can do regardless of where I am. And it's always a bit of an escape, which is nice during the pandemic when nobody was going anywhere. Right, right. So uh, what inspired you to start writing? And when did you consider yourself a writer? I never really remember a time when I wasn't. I was pretty much writing as soon as I knew how to write. And uh, that I wrote my first story when I was seven years old. I wrote my first novel when I was 10. It was terrible, but you know, it, it got me started. And I was pretty much never working on something uh, with that, uh, after that without it. So um, I really did get started young. And I think I always have just had the imagination that always asked, what if and wanted me to make a story out of everything so really uh, i just can't remember what it was that was my impetus it simply has been part of me for as long as i can recall wow now you you normally are you you in the past have written a lot about strong women and a lot of people write about historic landmarks or certain places in in uh, the world how do you decide what you're going to write about well, I think it's a lot of trial and error because I wrote a lot of books uh, before I ended up writing the one that ended up being my first published novel, Mistress of Rome. And it ended up being something where a lot of that was trial and error, figuring out what it was I wanted to say with the stories that I wrote. And everybody has their own uh, fascinations. And I don't think you can choose those. You really can't. I always remember Stephen King saying that um, he spent way too much of his career being vaguely ashamed of what it was that he wrote. And he said too much time uh, because, you know, so many well-meaning people told him, you know, Stevie, you have talent. Why would you waste your time on writing this dreck? And he just said after a while, you know what? I have a love of the unquiet coffin and the active graveyard. Just sue me. It's what I love. <laughs> so I don't think anybody can really choose what they're fascinated with. And what I realized I am fascinated with, first of all, is stories of the past. I've never really had much interest in writing about the modern day, though I love reading modern day set stories. It's just never been what I've been interested in writing about. And I have always, I realized, been interested in what women have been doing in the past. And that's really the thing it took me a while to figure out. It is not so much for me uh, what era my books are set in, because they're set anywhere, everywhere from first century Imperial Rome to Renaissance Italy to uh, World War I, World War II. Uh, but it's not so much about the era for me. It's about what were the ladies doing during these periods? Because I'm always interested in the ways in which women carve out spheres of power and influence for themselves in historical times when the laws were not on their side. And, but you know, people, even if they are disempowered by the law, they find ways in which to gain influence. They always do. And I've always been interested in how women have made a difference, how they have survived, how they have thrived, how they have prospered and how they have left their mark. So that's generally what I look for whenever I am looking at a historical time period or an event, what were the ladies doing? Because they were almost always doing something interesting, even if that what they were doing is not what we learn about front and center in the history books. 
It's so interesting because in history class, you know, when you're in high school, it's really not that interesting usually depending on your teacher but you because you're memorizing dates and locations and it's not really about stories and i find that with historical fiction authors and with you and your your books it makes learning about history interesting because of the way that you are creating a story around it well i think that's one of the reasons why so many people you know, are bored with history because they think it's boring and it's not. If you've had a good teacher, they will be able to impart to you that history is only about people, people who are motivated by exactly the same emotions that we are motivated by today, whether that is love or passion or lust or greed or fear or prejudice, any kind of emotion we are having today, people had then and that are those are the things that drive history. They always have. And so often history is taught badly. And I feel badly for the people who then conclude that history is boring. I was lucky enough to have very good teachers, uh, some very good teachers of history. And you really, from the very first, I was taught, you know, a lot of fun history from my mother who had that ancient and medieval history degree. So she was telling me stories from history at a young age. And those were fun stories. I mean, it, it may sometimes get you into trouble when you're in fifth grade and, and the game that you like to play on the playground is you're walking around with a soccer ball under one arm because you imagine you're mad, you're playing a game where you were Anne Boleyn's ghost haunting Heber Castle, but you also know a hell of a lot about, you know, the divorce of Anne Bo the divorce of Catherine of Aragon, so Henry VIII could marry Anne Boleyn, and the whole Church of England could get started and all of that. So these are all things that I was learning, but I learned them the fun way. And I think really that historical fiction is not primary, should not be primarily used to teach because, you know, we always flex things and, you know, change things for the sake of our stories because we're entertainers first. But it can be a gateway for people to want to learn more when they learn that a story of the past is interesting and that it has, it makes you want to learn more, want to go down that Google rabbit hole and figure out what was real and what wasn't. And so hopefully historical fiction can serve nonfiction in a very good way and make people who maybe did not have the best teachers in school, the ones who were just rotely memorizing long lists of dates and parliamentary acts and so forth, realize that history really is fun and that they can have fun with it. Yeah, I mean, I definitely find myself Googling quite a bit when I read historical fiction, just to see, you know, what was real, what what was made up and what really happened. And it, it is fun to kind of do additional research while you're reading historical fiction, just to get the full story. So it, it, it's helpful. Uh, so for The Diamond Eye, can you tell us a little bit about how you went about doing research for this book? Well, I was very fortunate with this book because uh, Lyudmila Pavlichenko wrote a memoir later in life about her wartime experiences. And so there really isn't anything better for a novelist than having a real person's real words about their real experiences put in their own language and the way that they remember it. And so that really was my primary source and for this book. I was also fortunate enough to have a good many uh, articles, you know, and uh, pieces written by Eleanor Roosevelt, you know, her My Day columns have been digitized and put online. So I had the words from her mouth as well. And there's been a lot, quite a lot written about Lyudmila Pavlichenko too, since she was quite famous in her day as Lady Death. So I would, had a lot of material to work with, but it really, did, most for the most part, did come back to her memoir and her words, not just figuring out, you know, transmuting what she wrote right onto my own page, but figuring out what were the things that she left out, maybe. What were the things that, you know, she, because, you know, no one is totally honest, even in a memoir in which they want to tell their story. There are things that you want to leave out because you don't really want to talk about them to posterity. There are things that you might put in, especially in a Soviet memoir, because propaganda and censorship is an issue there. And so you can sort of see the stamp of propaganda that's on there in places and you think, uh, okay, well, we'll have to sort of take this part with a little bit of a grain of salt. So you have to do a little bit of a judgment call there as well. And 
it all ended up being a little bit of a balancing act, you know, because that, you know, treating that document as something that is the original primary source from the, from the, the mouth of the woman who lived this life, but also recognizing the places in which it might be incomplete or just simply not the whole story. So that was uh, a lot of fun. And that was really ended up being the thing that I liked doing the most for this particular book. <laughs> So you found, you came across her memoir and you read her memoir and then you decided she's going to be the star of your show. No, I didn't come across the memoir first. I actually came across a reference to her that it, when I was researching my uh, two books ago, the diamond, uh, excuse me, the, the huntress, the huntress has a heavy plot thread that it revolves around the night witches, which was the Soviet group of all female bomber pilots that flew against Hitler's Eastern front. And when I was reading about these women, I was suddenly also reading about all these other women references were coming up to these other Soviet women war heroines because the USSR was the only nation in the allied nation in World War II to put women in active combat. So therefore, I was suddenly finding about, you know, women who were in the Air Force, women who were in the uh, Army, women who drove tanks and, you know, flew fighter planes and bomber planes, and who, yes, were snipers. And among all these ladies, first and foremost of the, you know, the names I wasn't researching, but that kept coming up on the sides, was the name Ludmila Pavlichenko. She was one of the most famous of the Soviet women of war heroines. And I couldn't, you know, figure out how, I wasn't gonna put her in The Huntress, the book had no room for her, but I thought immediately, I am tucking her in my back pocket for later. She is too good to not do a book about. And so I did tuck her in my pocket. And later on, I did look up her memoir and was, you know, absolutely saying a hallelujah when I realized that her memoir had been translated into English. And there's an excellent translation out there. So I got the memoir and the more I read, the more I was fascinated because her voice is so immediate and so personal. And it was, you know, it made her story even better. And so I ended up deciding, well, after I wrote the Rose Code first in the end, but I decided after that, no, I think it's time for a Ludmilla's story. So she's been hanging around a little while in your in your head. Yes, she has been. <laughs> wow. Um, on this topic, I just wanted to pop in because uh, Amy had a, a comment that uh, that she really loved the feature that you were talking about with the discrepancies between the memoir, what really happened in finding those gaps. And she loved the opening of the chapters where you describe what the official transcript is versus the space, you know, the gaps between during which imagination strikes. Well, it's one of those things where I wanted to make it clear from the beginning that uh, Ludmilla's memoir is not the whole story. And there are very concrete and powerful reasons to make that clear because first and foremost, I would say, because she speak, she writes her memoir as a Ukrainian woman who was from Ukraine yet had a Russian father and whose memoir makes it clear that she does not ever voice any discomfort really about Ukraine being part of the Soviet Union she may not have had a problem with that. It seems maybe she didn't because her father was Russian. She was raised with his, you know, belief to support the state. And she was a city girl where the kind of, uh, the knowledge about the hungers that went on in Ukraine during the 30s was less prevalent than it was if you were living in the villages in the farmland and in the countryside. But on the other hand, we can't be sure because even if she'd had discomfort about uh, Ukraine's position in the Soviet Union, or she was more aware of it, she would not have been allowed to publish it. So, and you know, Soviet propaganda and censorship being what it is, there are places where you can tell that they definitely put their stamp on things. And I said, so therefore, I wanted to make it clear that there is gonna be a difference between what she publishes and what, what, what is true in far as what she publishes and what is true as far as what she lived. Now, I can't, I'm not saying I know what it was that she lived. I only know that there are definitely spots where she would have seen things that did not make it into her memoir, or she would have experienced, or there would have been things that, you know, she put in, but were taken out. And it's important to know that, you know, when you are dealing even with original documents, it's, um, it's never the whole story. But I think that's the fun part about examining documents from the past are the things that people say, and then also the things that they don't say. Uh, and sometimes that's political, as it is with when you have literally a, you know, Red Army censor sitting on your shoulder almost, you know, saying, no, you can't write that. Please put a reference to that in here and so forth. And you don't really have a choice. 
but also this can be personal. I mean, I think one of the most interesting things, um, I did decide to make a bit of a villain in my book out of her first husband, Alexi. She has very little about him in her memoir, about three lines. And the all she really says is, well, we came together, it was like a madness on my part, uh, that kind of infatuation, it did not last long, nor did the marriage after our son was born and he left. The thing I found the most uh, telling about that though, is the fact that she said, fortunately my son is nothing like his father. And I thought, wow, there is a world of emotion behind that word, fortunately. <laughs> And she's not saying what it is. And I get that because, you know, if you're a famous woman who has achieved a great deal, do you want your memoir to waste any page space on your lousy ex? You absolutely don't. But on the other hand, I looked at that and I thought, that's a place for me to expand. She doesn't say much about him. Therefore, we don't know much about him. Therefore, I expanded a little bit and made him into a more of a presence in the novel because I think there was a lot of bad feeling there and it was, was fun in that ghoulish way that writers say this things are fun to capitalize on that and see, explore maybe what might have been. So that's one of the reasons I did want to get, that's one of, you know, like one of the personal reasons in which you can anticipate that there's a gap in the, in the um, official documents, in the records, and what the reason for that gap might have been. And again, you know, too, since I had some beta readers who grew, who were uh, Russian or or had grown up in the Soviet Union themselves, uh, they actually said, yes, the difference between the public and the private is an, a hugely Soviet thing. What you say on the surface, what you put forward to the world, and what you keep private. And she said, so the whole idea of a juxtaposition between the official and the unofficial is a very Soviet thing. So I wanted to make sure that that was reflected, and that's why I ended up doing the um, official and unofficial versions of her memoir as chapter openings. That was enjoyable. I, I liked that part a lot. Um, so Alexei, the husband, his story was big. I mean, he was in this story a lot and he was bad. He was big and bad. When you are writing him in, your process, um, I, I'm wondering if you just write him as it comes to you or if you put in pieces of him as you're, as you're developing his character, because his character is mostly made up, right? His storyline is made up. And do you have to keep going back and adding more in, or do you know exactly how much you want to add in and where, you know, how do you, how do you filter, fit him in, I guess, is the question. Well, I knew the book needed a villain, uh, not just, you know, the big faceless villain of Nazi Germany, which is the big, you know, faceless villain she is fighting for them. And it is faceless for the most part. Um, I knew the book needed a more personal villain for her, you know, any story does. And I liked the idea that this woman who is so extraordinary and who becomes so extraordinary has to really face a very ordinary kind of man. And he is ordinary, although he is bad, because... Well, here's a fun thing. I remember I had a guy who told me, I just didn't believe the villain. He just seemed way too cartoonish awful to me. And I just thought, I, I laughed because almost all the women I know who read this book said, oh, I so know this guy. I have tangled with this guy. I have dated this guy. I know <laughs> this guy. And I think is, I think most people, most women have met an Alexi at some point in their life. He's the guy who wants his girlfriend to be wide-eyed and, and you know, just absolutely starry-eyed for every word that comes out of his mouth. He's the guy who always wants to be the biggest man in the room, the most important man in the room, who has a big ego, but does not like seeing it challenged. And he does not like being outdone, especially by the women in his life. There are a lot of these guys on Twitter. We've blocked, the, we've all blocked a few of them, I am sure. But this guy is not very uncommon. He's actually relatively easy to find. Now, hopefully um, he's not the kind of guy who will one day try to kill his uh, ex-girlfriend because she outdid him. But there are a lot of types who do have that big ego and they want their, the women in their lives to be wide-eyed and admiring and they get really pissed off that they aren't. And they're the kinds who can be emotionally abusive just in the sense that they're kind of always chipping away at your self-esteem and they're you know, always just, just subtly putting you down and trying to make you feel less good about yourself. And so I thought, well, what better adversary for someone like Ludmila to, to have? If she starts out, you know, when she's this young woman who is 
you know, still, who is still, you know, somewhat afraid of this man. You know, he has the ability to make her life difficult. She has had her ego and her achievements chipped away by his jokes and his, you know, derision. But the thing is, is that she outgrows him. She grows so much bigger than him. She faces so much more than someone like him can ever throw into her path to make her life hard. And she outgrows him and he doesn't like that. And I liked the idea that this is, although it is also the story of, you know, a woman, an ordinary single mother, an aspiring historian, a library researcher who becomes a sniper, which is entirely awesome enough, but it's also a story I thought about a woman who started as, well, a little bit of an abused wife in some ways, who is growing past and out of that smaller person that she was into someone who can absolutely look at an abusive or asshole ex, excuse my language, and just say, I so don't have time for you. I will squash you under my foot if you make any more trouble for me and absolutely mean it. And that was a very, you know, personally satisfying thing to be able to write. And as for, you know, historically, do we know if that was accurate or not? Well, no, we don't. We do know that this man, uh, there's some indication he was a doctor of some kind, which I would think for his time would mean it's almost certain that he would have ended up as an army doctor. Almost all men were going of a certain age were you know, going to be funneled into the army at some point. And we also know that he was older than she was and that she got pregnant when she was barely 15. So we know that this man definitely targeted a much, much younger, inexperienced girl. And we know that he decided to walk out on her and on their baby when their marriage was only a matter of weeks or months old. And we know from her memoir that he was not a part of her son's life as a father. So just given those facts, I thought, now I think my characterization is at least pretty plausible. What kind of guy does go after a girl who's barely 15 when he meets her at a dance? What kind of guy then does walk out on his very young, very, uh, very young wife, you know, a matter of weeks or months after she's given birth? What kind of man does decide he's just not going to be a father to this boy that he fathered on a girl who is much too young to be doing this on her own? I thought it wasn't unlikely. So that's how I crafted his character. And uh, writing him was a lot of fun in the sense of, um, it was fun building him up because I knew eventually it was gonna come down to Mila finally taking the time to swat him like the bug that he is. So you you knew from the beginning that you were gonna have her end him in the end? <laughs> oh yes, I knew that. I knew it was gonna be satisfying and I knew it was gonna be fun, so. Yeah. It she was. does go after him and, um, or she finally is pushed to the point where, you know, he finally, or he finally is pushed to the point where he really can't stand it anymore uh, in terms of uh, this little mouse of a woman who he used to be married to, who is now so much more than he could ever, you know, imagine, who is brave, who is big, who is heroic, who is famous. And, you know, like many, as many abused women will tell you, the most dangerous moment for a woman when she's trying to leave an abusive relationship or, you know, finally put it behind her is the moment when she leaves and when someone, when an abusive spouse or an abusive partner thinks they're going to leave me and some, or someone else is going to take, or they're going to move on to someone else. And it's the whole thing of, that's a dangerous moment because they don't in really want to let someone go because they're used to having that person be dependent on them, even if it's just dependent in the sense of, well, I need to know that she'll still cringe if I make a certain kind of joke. You know, someone's ego depends on that. So that in the end ended up being, you know, something that I thought would be satisfying to see her grow beyond, even as she's also growing to the point of, you know, from an ordinary civilian to this, you know, national war hero. Mm -hmm. It, it is um, very interesting how you took her and the information you had about her was really her her journey professionally, and you and you added her personal journey, which built the story into what it was, and that it made it very rewarding because you know that was her big victory in the end, aside from her professional success, but her personal journey was really you know, something that I know I was rooting for when I was reading it. 
Well, it's one of those things that when you're writing biographical historical fiction, you can't just recite the facts of someone's life. If people want to read that, they can go to the Wikipedia page. What you also need to craft is what is the inward arc? What are people, what is the journey for this person on the inside as well as on the out? And what it comes down to for me when I'm crafting that is that the question that I'm always think I'm always thinking about is there's always a belief that someone has which has to change. The thing that they believe in strongly, but that they don't realize is actually holding them back. And that ends up being one of the key things I think about when I'm trying to craft an internal arc for a character. And for Lamilla, it really came down to her whole mantra of don't miss. You know, it's her whole, this perfectionism that she has, which she has trained in herself because, because she was a teen mom, because she did make this terrible mistake that could so easily have derailed her life. And so she thought, well, I can't just make any other mistakes ever again. And then she goes into, into marksmanship where and sharpshooting where her perfectionism is just fueled because you know a tiny miss could mean the difference between life and death. And I thought that that was realistic, not only as a, you know, as a, as a sharpshooter for her, but the fact that so many women are perfectionists. We never, we, do, we don't let ourselves off the hook. We are constantly trying to take on too much, trying to live up to the expectations of our families, as you know, to our families, as daughters or as wives or as mothers, to society, you know, what we're supposed to be, what we're supposed to, you know, want to our jobs, you know, trying to do, you know, succeed in balancing the family and the work. All these things make women perfectionists. We're especially prone to it. And so Mila is a perfectionist and what she has to learn, and it's ultimately the thing that really Eleanor gently points out to her is that it's not a way to be happy. It might give you professional success, but it means you are stressed and taught and unforgiving on the inside, mostly unforgiving to yourself. So that friendship with Eleanor really is the thing that starts Mila thinking that maybe there are some things I have always taken for true, which aren't true. And that in the end is the thing that she's gonna need to learn if she's gonna be happy. Um, I'm popping in. Uh, so there's a detail question that's that's kind of fun. Uh, uh, Darby is uh, saying that she loved how uh, she used the diamonds as a decoy to get the other sniper very clever. Was that a creation from you? Um, yes, because the marksman uh, ploy at the end was a little bit of a fabrication on my part. But it is true that snipers use decoys. Like, for example, she does decoy. She does um, describe very thoroughly in her uh, memoir that duel that she fought with a German sniper, where she and her sniper partner rigged up a decoy soldier with a, like a stuffed uniform and a weapon so that they could get the other sniper to fire on this person or this this dummy and then get them to and then you know give away their position and that kind of thing was extremely common so I just had her use the same trick and it was true that flashers or things of light could often be used to you know like either it would give somebody's position away or it could be used to lure someone. I use the diamonds because it enabled me to make sense of and utilize one of the most strange things from her memoir, which was this anecdote that she told where it really was true that when she was on this Goodwill tour of the United States, an American millionaire named William Johnson saw her on one of her speeches, fell madly in love with her, apparently at first sight, traveled around, started following her around the country, like going to her various events and eventually proposed marriage to her. And, you know, she, you know, after like probably picking her jaw up off the floor is sort of like, wait, what you know, like, why are you even think what you followed a woman around all over the country, listening to her talk about her 309 kills and you thought perfect wife material, like what is wrong with you? And so she said, no, obviously. And the thing is, he gave her a set of diamond jewelry as a give it going away present when she left the United States. And I saw this, I, I didn't see the jewels, but I saw the description, which was, it was a necklace, it was bracelets, earrings, a brooch, a ring, like a whole set. And there is a value, it was valued at like X amount, which I ran the conversion for, for inflation. And that's a six figure set of diamonds he, he gave her. This was like Academy Award kind of stuff that you see movie stars wearing on the red carpet. And he gave this to her with a note that said, we will meet again. 
Now, according to her, they never did meet again. She left the country the following day and they never did meet again. But the thing is, I'm sorry, you can't give a novelist like a velvet box full of diamonds and a note this is we'll meet again and not have the novelist do something with it. That's too good not to use. So I ended up using this for, uh, because I immediately started asking what if as novelists do. And my question was, well, what if they did meet again? What if there was a way for them to meet again? What did he really mean by that? Was that just literally a lovesick man's goodbye present or was it something maybe a little sinister? So I made it something a little sinister. And that's why I use the diamonds not only as um, a flasher for the duel, which enables her to win this fight, which is quite desperate, but it also utilizes something that really did happen to Lyudmila Pavlichenko, which was that gift of jewelry in that rather enigmatic note that she got from that rather enigmatic man who apparently proposed marriage to her. So there we go. <laughs> I love it. There's also just a couple comments I'll relay and then toss it back over to you, Jen, about that relationship with Eleanor Roosevelt. Barbara was saying she just loved that relationship and Amy reiterating what the point that you had just made Kate, about um, that Eleanor taught her that it's okay to misfire and to keep trying. So let's talk a little bit about um, the relationship between Eleanor Roosevelt and Mila. What, um, what other stories were true that you learned about in her memoir with Eleanor? Because a lot of the things that happened with the two of them seemed unreal. Those are the ones that were real. Like yeah. it was absolutely real that um, Mila did have that they, their first exchange did appear to be a little frosty that it came out of uh, Mila's memoir because she came in and there was this welcome breakfast at the White House and Eleanor apparently did make a comment about, well, can you see the faces of those, you know, through your, through your sights of those you fire on? Because if you can, I wonder that Americans will be able to understand you. And Mila had this really rather sharp reply where she said, you live in a beautiful country that's never been invaded, but my country has not been that lucky. And as far as I am, you've never had to see, you know, your homeland leveled, your house is burning, you know, your fathers and brothers and sons killed and husbands killed. And as far as I am concerned, when I look through my sights, uh, the German I am firing at is the same one who killed my husband. And there was a long silence after that. And Eleanor did apparently, you know, make some efforts to, um, uh, to you know, really make amends for that particularly, uh, that somewhat terse beginning that they had. Because it was true that she gave Mila a ride to uh, a White House dinner in DC. And that the woman known as Lady Death was clutching the door and saying like, this woman is driving like a maniac. <laughs> and it was, because Eleanor drove her there herself, apparently driving like a bat out of hell and was, you know, breaking down all the factions that, you know, she was going to meet and you know, telling her who she was going to talk to. And, it was also true that uh, Lyudmila went was invited to the Roosevelt estate on the Hudson and fell into the water after her canoe, a canoe that she took out was uh, capsized. And that El Eleanor, just like, you know, fussy mothers everywhere, was like, come in, you will catch your death of cold. And, you know, literally was, you know, handing her towels to dry off and hemmed a pair of pink pajamas for her so that she had something dry to climb into. And she had to hem them because Eleanor was almost six feet tall and Mila was about five, four. Uh, and then it was true, true apparently as well that FDR came in because he was looking for why is my wife late to lunch and realized that, you know, there his, is his wife, the first lady of the United States, sitting there having a pair of pajamas as there's, you know, a, a Ukrainian woman sniper sitting on the bed wrapped in towels. And the two of them are having some lively discussion about, you know, everything from fashion to politics to movies. And he probably just thought, no one would believe this if I said anything, but here we are. And so that everybody laughed at that apparently. And it was true as well that uh, Eleanor did uh, accompany Mila as, you know, her so almost like, a, almost like a guide on a part of her Goodwill tour and that they rode in the bulletproof proof limousine together. They talked about everything from, you know, segregation in America, which Mila found appalling, uh, all the way to, you know, the, you know, the, the scenery, the countryside that they were seeing and how did it compare to Russian scenery. And, there was a lovely story too about how Mila remembers falling asleep across on the drive across the Midwest and she woke up with her head on Eleanor's shoulder as Eleanor is shaking her awake and saying, darling, we're in Chicago now and you have a speech to give. 
<laughs> so I really did love uh, that relationship between them. And it is true that they wrote to each other afterward um, when they were separated for the next 15 years or so. And the thing that I really loved was that they met in the 1950s when Eleanor was widowed, when she came to the USSR on a goodwill tour of her own. And she and Mila met up in Moscow first time in about 15 years and apparently you know it's a little awkward at first because you know there's all these KGB types standing around and everybody's bodyguards and minders but they finally got rid of everybody and had tea in Mila's apartment and apparently the two of them really did just like fall into each other's arms with a great big hug and say you know and they just had a great visit for the next hour or something like that and I loved that and I knew right from the beginning that was going to be my um final image in the epilogue of this book would be that meeting between them. It was really such a, a jackpot that it turned out that Mila had this relationship with Eleanor Roosevelt because Eleanor Roosevelt is so rich in, in things that have been written about her and such an interesting woman and a great character in a book a, along with FDR. So it made, made it so so much more rich than it might've been even you know, without, without the two of them in there. Well, it is one of those things that is very true about Eleanor. You might think like, really, could the first lady have been quite so informal with people? She really was. She had a great gift for friendship. Um, you know, she was a woman born to incredible privilege, you know, this very wealthy family, uh, this political dynasty, you know, all the you know, all the advantages that money and education and birth could bring. And yet she had tremendous compassion and she was constantly throughout her whole life able to reach across the divide of birth and privilege to be able to make connections with people who have, were nothing like her. She did make these friendships with the most unlikely people and we are much the better for it because she was always able to understand what is it that I don't know? What is it that someone else's experience could teach me? And what is it that I can take from that and then learn, use to make other people's lives better, which she was constantly doing. I don't know if you've read the book by Amy Bloom called White Houses, but it's about Eleanor Roosevelt and her relationship with Loretta Hickok, who was a, um, a, a journalist at the time. Yes. And uh, it's just, she's so fascinating. So I, I loved that she was in here and she wasn't the only famous person in here. You also um, mentioned Laurence Olivier and Charlie Chaplin. So tell us about those characters. Well, it was like, great fun that Mila's memoir, um, she really did go around and meet everybody. I mean, Paul Robeson sang for her in New York City. Woody Guthrie wrote a song about her, which you can find on uh, Spotify or on YouTube. It's called Miss Pavlichenko. And like, if you imagine a country song, a, a country Western song about a, about a Ukrainian sniper, it's there. Um, she went to these Hollywood parties. She met Charlie Chaplin, who got on one, got on one knee and kissed her hand. Uh, she met Mary Pickford and Douglas Fairbanks. And the most fun that I found that I, I really thought was the most uh, hilarious thing, I wanted to include it in the back in my historic photographs, but I couldn't figure out where, I couldn't get the permissions for the picture. But I found a picture and you can Google it. I know you can. Um, there is a great picture of when Mila met Lawrence Olivier. Someone snapped this and he is looking down at her. He's about a head taller. He is looking down at her and he is smoldering for all he's worth. He's like, he's so, he's so big and handsome and like at his absolute prime at this point, he is smoldering down at her, giving her the full thing, full treatment. And she is giving him this look like, which is just hilarious because it could not be clearer if anybody was putting captions on this or thought bubbles that he's thinking I have definitely got a shot here I'm gonna bag the woman sniper and she is thinking and she is clearly thinking back at him buddy if that hand slides any further down my waist you are drawing back a stump <laughs> and it is the funniest picture I really have seen throughout all the many pictures that were taken of Ludmilla during her uh, goodwill tour and during her life she was photographed a lot and it was one of those things, I love seeing those pictures because she was incredibly photogenic. Um, just, she had such warmth and charm just in, the, in her expressions and in her, her liveliness. And so it was a lot of fun just uh, tracking the pictures of her. She was really, she was a tough cookie. And she, when she was on that Goodwill tour, the media really went at her um, 
and she she went she lashed right back. She was tough about it. But can you tell us a little bit about you know some of the questions the media was asking her and how she how she navigated all of that? Well, that really came right out of her memoir and um, almost word for word some of it and. Her very first press conference really did make my jaw drop because here's this woman, she has this tally of 309 enemy invaders to her name. She is in uniform, she's a lieutenant. She has you know, various you know, decorations. She is still he- feeling physically from war wounds. And you know, mentally from you know, not long ago, she was involved in an extremely violent and, you know, tragic siege that went horribly badly where she would have seen many of her friends die. Here she is in the spotlight and she's thinking about her mission, which is now like, well, let's see if we can try to persuade them to send American aid to my friends who are still fighting and dying. And the questions she is starting to get are things like, can you wear lipstick at the front? What's your makeup routine? Can you take hot baths? What kind of underwear do you prefer? Do you care that like, isn't the uniform a little unflattering? You know, service women in America have shorter skirts. Yours make you look, that length on you makes you look fat. Do you mind? And she's sitting there like, really? This is what you want to know? And the thing that came to my mind initially was, uh, unfortunately, how we have not necessarily come very far. Because what came to my mind was the fact that, I don't know if anybody else uh, noticed this, but when the movie The Avengers came out, all the actors who were the Avengers went on the, you know, the whole press junket thing. And the guys were all asked things like, so what is it like stepping into these huge shoes of this comic book god? Or, you know, what is it like, you know, doing this big juicy character arc for this character and, you know, these fabulous stunts and things like that. And then Scarlett Johansson is Black Widow. It gets, so what kind of workout routine did you have to fit into that really tight black jumpsuit? And she was just sort of like, really? That's the question I'm getting. And I just thought, wow, um, we haven't necessarily come that far. So it did not at all strike me as unusual that she would have gotten these questions. She got a lot of doubt. People who were saying like, yeah, they're saying this is a sniper. This is not a sniper. This is a PR stunt. And she was constantly being asked to prove herself in a way that I do not believe they uh, asked her male counterparts on the tour to do. And she did eventually start snapping back at that. And I really had to cheer when she had this one speech that went absolutely, well, nowadays we'd say it went viral. It totally did at the time, which meant it was reported almost worldwide. But she was in Chicago and that's when she really decided to let fly. And she just said, gentlemen, I am 26 years old and I have dispatched 309 of my enemy invaders. Don't you think, gentlemen, that you have been hiding behind my back for long enough? And there is dead silence for a moment and then she gets a standing O. So it's one of those things where, you know, she really did start to hit back, but she earned a lot of respect for it, you know, in that odd way. You know, she really did become America's sweetheart. You know, she was getting big ovations where she went to make speeches and, um, she really did get, a, you know, did, I think, help turn some of the tide against, you know, like, well, we can't possibly help anybody who's a Soviet or a communist. And she, her, part of her job was, you know, to try to put a human face on it. You know, we are your allies. Please help us. We are dying by the millions over there. Please help. And it was not too long after that, that, you know, you know, Roosevelt was starting to make the push more for let's get involved in the war in Europe against Hitler and not just the war in the Pacific against Japan. She was really the perfect person to represent because she started out in this job as a sniper so young that she never really was like the woman that had to worry about the lipstick and the all of that. She never even made it to that part of her life. She was so young and went really from a kid into this job. So it was probably easier for her than, you know, any, any other woman sniper or any other woman who was on this, you know, to, to be called up on a tour to be able to say, you know, don't ask me stupid questions like that. You know, she, she didn't even live that kind of life. Well, she was, um, not only was she, you know, she was personable and, you know, she was a little uncomfortable in the spotlight, but she became used to it, but she was well-spoken and she had, you know, she was educated. She was 
you know, I think, a li- and she was uh, charming. She had that kind of, you know, she has a sort of self-deprecation about her that's just incredibly cute. I hate to say, if you can describe a lethal woman sniper as cute, she was. <laughs> and it was one of those things I think where, and it's something that surprised me, you know, when I was researching her is that you have, and I think Americans did at the time as well, an idea of what a woman sniper would look like. They were imagining it was going to be some, you know, like monstrous Soviet superwoman who's made out of granite and, you know, has no conscience and, you know, flat, dead, ice cold eyes and that kind of thing. You know, it's like some woman with, you know, you know, absolutely no qualm about doing this, you know, work, which seems very scary. And instead they get this adorable little brunette, you know, who wants to be, you know, uh, who wants to be an historian someday and who can be very passionate and serious about this work that she has done and who does not take pride in her tally, you know, like it's not something that she boasts about or brags about. It's simply something she had to do. And she surprised them clearly. And I think that was probably one of the best things that could have happened because they expected some kind of monster and they got a very human woman in turn, in, 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 instead. And so that I think is you know, probably the biggest advantage she had going for her was that she was so human. It's like, it is very clear that you, know, you do need a level of emotional control and detachment to be able to work as a sniper because you have to work alone. You have to suppress adrenaline rather than count on it to, you know, fuel you. You have to be patient and you have to be able to work unsupported or almost unsupported in darkness. And you're going to see the faces of the people who you're pulling a trigger on. But at the same time, it doesn't mean that you're a monster. And she wasn't. She really was, you know, she was a single mother. She was a graduate student. She was, you know, wanted to be historian someday. She could absolutely geek out about history details and like archeological digs and about her favorite books. And, you know, she had all of these deeply human qualities. And that's the thing I loved about her most was that she absolutely is someone that you could imagine yourself being friends with who would be in your book group and who would have absolutely read the book and probably did some associated reading and read the footnotes and like has colored highlighter markings on all of her school notes that's the woman who this is. And like the fact that we could so easily imagine ourselves knowing her, I think is what makes her story truly extraordinary rather than the cliche that, well, the only woman who could have done what she did had to be some sort of like trained from childhood to be a killer, you know, woman who was born in a lab or, you know, like born in some, you know, Siberian out, you know, waste, wasteland, you know, who was chewing bullets in her cradle, you know, and that's the only kind of woman who could do this. Right. Well, so clearly she was likable. In fact, she was in a little bit of a love triangle. Um, Tell us about that and what's real and what's not real. (laughs) Well, we know a lot about her first romance, which is um, with uh, her husband. Well, she called him her husband. It's not, I wasn't clear to me whether he was or not, because he wasn't listed on her grave as her husband, which made me wonder if maybe it was a, a less, uh, it was a more unofficial kind of like common law marriage almost sort of thing that they had. But she did call him her husband and it was her company commander who um, she describes this, his name was Leonia, his nickname. He was this big blonde, this big Viking, handsome Viking of a man, she said, who absolutely like fell for her on the front lines and started courting her. And he literally did, uh, when she was wounded, he carried her off the battlefield, got her to the hospital battalion, uh, donated blood so that she'd have blood for her surgery, uh, waited throughout the surgery. And then he visited her all through in the hospital, all as she was recovering. And then he invited her to dinner on her first night out recovered from the hospital battalion. And he really pulled out like a, the closest thing to a candlelight dinner that a man can do when he's on the front lines. And he has, li- he's living in a trench dugout because <laughs> he had like a full spread, as many goodies as he could find to eat. He had flowers that he'd put in a vase made out of a shell casing. And he had pretty much pulled out all the stops and he proposed marriage to her. And they were inseparable from that moment on. And the two of them really did have this wonderful relationship. I am, the, I'm really trying to figure out how to not to spoil this for people who haven't seen it, but what becomes of him and that relationship 
happened very much as in her memoir, as I described it, almost word for word. Um, that relationship was wonderfully romantic, but it did have a bit of a tragic finish. And um, her grief was just uh, devastating, clearly. And she described that she was not able to return to shooting afterward until she and her partner, who was her sniper partner who hunted with her, grieved together for him, for uh, the man she loved. And so that made me think, well, I think her partner must have liked this guy too. They must have been friends. And it made me wonder what was this relationship with her sniper partner like? Because, you know, I am a, yeah, I'm a Navy wife. I talked, to, I'd known a few sharpshooter types or my husband has known some. And the fact is a, a sniper and their lookout uh, partner are very, very close. They work together about as closely as two human beings can work together. Um, they put their lives in each other's hands in this absolute, with, in, with absolute trust or it will not work. And so that made me think her sniper partner must have been an incredibly close relationship, but she doesn't say much about him. So I had to flesh out his character. And um, we know almost nothing about him except that he was Siberian and that she has some details about how close they were. And so I did flesh his uh, character out and I combined him with the figure that came up later in her life about whom she's similarly a little tight-lipped. So I put them together because we didn't really know as much about either man. And so I sort of melded those two since they were both critical figures in her life. And since that one guy, we know he was important to her, I did have to flesh him out because I couldn't write a book without him. He was a part of her life that could not be overlooked. So I really had fun with that love triangle, the fact that she has these two men who are friends with each other, who are both in love with her. And the fact is though, that they have a mature kind of love triangle because I did not want to write the kind that is in badly written YA. And I say badly written, there's a lot of great YA out there, but badly written YA love triangles, you know, the type that we know where there's one girl being incredibly indecisive for thousands of pages and two guys who don't do anything about this except glare at each other. So I thought this is gonna be a love triangle between three people who have deep love and respect for each other and who are going to be adults about this whole situation and they're not gonna ruin friendships or relationships over the fact that, well, you picked him instead of me, that, that's not gonna ruin things for them. Cause you know, they're adults, they're in a war, they have bigger things to worry about. And for one thing also, it makes them, makes the two men that she, who are very important to her, so much more mature than her husband who has that, you know, dog with a bone thing where he's not, doesn't want her in his life anymore, but he's still not granting her a divorce because he doesn't really want anybody else to have her either. You know, that's such an immature reaction. And the two men that she loves in very different ways are far better human beings and far more mature than that. So I had a lot of fun that, uh, with the two of them, uh, with the three of them actually, and sort of making it clear, you know, what these two relationships were like. <sighs> I think it really worked too, because they had to show a lot of restraint because of their situation and because they're in a war and one of them is a sniper, it makes sense that they have that in them to have that restraint and control and be able to be adults about it. So it, it, it was a great part of the book. I enjoyed those relationships and just the, the waiting to see what was going to happen with each guy and, you know, how that was going to pan out. I'm speaking glad you liked of, it. I had a lot of fun writing them. Speaking of sort of one of the many romantic gestures with uh, Kostya, uh, Brie is asking, was the carrying around her dissertation in her memoir? Um, it doesn't mention that she carried it, but we do know that that's what her dissertation was about. And as soon as I read that, that whole thing that her dissertation is about Bogdan Khmelnytsky and the accession of Ukraine to the uh, uh, to the Soviet Union or to the to Russia in you know 1654 and the activities of the Pereyaslav Council. I was just like, that is the nerdiest thing I have ever read in my life. And that is the joke that just keeps on giving. So I decided that's too good not to use. So I had that be, you know, that that's the bit of the student that she keeps. And I did have her take it to war with her. Um, Speaking of a romantic gesture, uh, it's her partner who ends up retyping it for her. And I owe that to um, that act, that whole thing to 
the lovely author named Bruce Holsinger. I don't know if anyone's read his book, The Gifted School. It's wonderful. But he had a great thing on Twitter where he actually did a whole thing with a hashtag and everything about all the male writers who he had who he had read, who in their district, who in their acknowledgments thanked their wives for typing their manuscripts. And his whole thing was like, what the hell, guys? You can't type retype your own manuscript. Why is your wife doing it for you? You know, it's like all, and he kept, you know, citing all these male authors, kept saying things like, shout out to the wife for, you know, typing this manuscript for me six times, all six drafts. And, and he was just like, really? You, you couldn't do your own? So I looked at that and I was just like, you know, flowers and dinner are a very romantic relationship, a very romantic gesture. But I think a romantic gesture for any, it's any scholarly woman out there will be a guy who retyped your dissertation. So I had that be the thing that he does, you know, because your dissertation really is pretty beat up by the time it's been through two sieges and the and uh, 16 months at the Russian front. So that is the ultimate romantic gesture for her is that when her partner retypes her dissertation with two fingers taking a week and presents her with a clean copy unlike the other way around. So uh, as uh, Bruce pointed out in his Twitter feed. So that was a lot of fun. And I put that in kind of just as a little bit of a tip of the hat. How long did it take you to write this book to come up with all these little fun things that you slip in, you know, in between all the true facts that are in there too? I did a certain number of months of outlining first and then um, the book itself, uh, I did the rough draft in about three and a half months and that's very fast for me. Um, yeah. But it was locked down. Nobody was going anywhere. This was escapism, pure and simple. So honestly, I think that's why it came out so quickly. I finished in January of 2021. And really, there was one more year and a little bit as far as several more rounds of editing and also the, um, and, you know, putting it into the publication cycle. So honestly, this book was came out about as quickly as a historical novel can. <laughs> about a year and a half, maybe from uh, beginning to end. That's amazing. And the, the research part of it, you didn't have to go anywhere. you were, you did it from home. I had to, nobody was going anywhere in 2020. Right. So it was, um, wasn't a matter of, well, I can do it all the research at home. It was, I guess you have to do all the research at home. Um, some things that wasn't so hard, but there were other parts, like a lot of the stuff in Russia, I don't think I would have gone to the, to Ukraine to, necessarily do this I would have liked to but a lot of the scenery that she was looking at isn't necessarily still there today or it's been destroyed or it looks very different so that is something where I relied a little bit more on her descriptions because that probably would have been more accurate than what I would have been looking at if I'd gone to the site themselves in at least a few places I would, on the other hand, have liked to go to Washington, D.C. and do some work traveling there and do a little bit of mapping out of the grounds, especially of the final climactic scene in Rock Creek Park, where there's a duel that happens in the middle of the uh, this lovely little stretch of wilderness is right in the middle of the city because I could not go there. And that meant that in the end, I was tearing my hair out and trying to plan a snipe, trying to plot a sniper duel out on Google Earth. <laughs> <laughs> and did Google come after you? Did you get any strange messages uh, through Facebook or anything like that based on those Google searches? Mm -hmm. Not so much <laughs> about Grot Creek Park, although I really did have some uh, have some fears when it came to the fact when you're trying to uh, when you're trying to find questions, you're tr trying to you're doing searches online for information is like really how long is the shot someone if someone was trying to make a shot from the bushes on the south lawn of the white house to the portico strictly for fictional purposes let me assure you and if the weapon you're using is a mosin nagant uh, rifle with pe sights night circa 1942 and because i was typing that in and i was just like oh boy hello there homeland security please don't show up at my doorstep Right. How did you know about the different kinds of weapons and all of the, the combat behavior, the way they smoked the cigarettes and all of that? How did how did you learn about all of that? Uh, a lot of it came, a lot of it, especially this stuff about actual details of sniping and shooting came from Mila herself. Her memoir is really quite specific in a lot of ways, in a way that was very helpful. And also, you know, I, I have, I was able to talk to quite a few uh, military and ex-military types who were my beta readers 
who helped me figure out uh, what would this have actually looked like, or, you know, like, no, this is more likely than that. Can you have an explanation for this? And um, they, they gave me a lot of great help when it came to expert advice. Interesting. Now, I, I'm asking everybody that's here, if you want to type in the, um, the chat before I ask Kate, I would wonder who, if this movie, The Diamond Eye, became a movie, who would you think would be great to cast in this, in this movie? So I, I want people to write in who they think. And then, Kate, you can tell us, first of all, is there any talk about it being a movie or any of your books becoming movies? And then uh, for The Diamond Eye, who would you think would be great in the cast? Uh, no nibbles on this one so far for film option, but I can say that The Rose Code, The Alice Network, and The Huntress have all been optioned as limited series, which would mean like a mini series, not, uh, which is awesome all by different uh companies so and uh, really i don't know any more than that right now uh, so no news about casting or filming or where it might stream from uh, because options really are just the first step in a very long process so no guarantees uh even now it's just basically the first step has happened and i'm really hoping that you know hopefully we'll see more so we shall see um yeah so all three of those are, have been optioned nothing about uh the diamond eye yet, but if you'd like, I do think that when I'm casting, if I were to have, you know, casting approval, which no writer ever gets, by the way, so this will never right. be up to me. <laughs> but if you're doing the, you know, just for fun kind of thing, uh, I would cast, I think you'd have to cast uh, Mila Kunis as Mila because she actually is Ukrainian and she speaks Russian and she is a petite brown eyed brunette, which is exactly what Mila also looked like. So I really think, you know, it's fate, come on. I mean, it has to be, it has to be Mila because you, know, you also, I think it would be important you'd have to have a woman who was Ukrainian in this part. So uh, given all, especially all the work that she has done like in support of Ukraine lately, like right. I would say I'd have her in a heartbeat. <laughs> Yeah, she would be perfect, definitely. And then you'd need an Eleanor Roosevelt too, because that's a big part. Yeah, I maybe just let's just have Gillian Anderson because she did just do Eleanor on that mini series, the first was it the first ladies, something like that. Okay. Uh, but she did Eleanor in that, so it's like I'll just ask her, did you keep the prosthetic nose and you know the fox fur stole and the outfit? Because maybe just put it all back on and we'll just waltz you over to a brand new set and you can just do it all over again. That would be perfect. I like her. Um, what are you working on now? I know it's like silly to ask because you just finished this, but I'm sure you have something cooking. Um, my next book is titled The Briar Club, at least uh, that's the name right now. And it is takes place during in an all-female boarding house in Washington, D.C. in the early 1950s. So we are looking at McCarthyism, the Red Scare, the Cold War, all of that nice, dark, delicious, gritty stuff, uh, lots of territory and lots of stuff to use, lots of material for a novelist. So that's, that's the next fun. book. And I'm just working on it now. And I don't have, there's no release date yet because I have not even worked out the uh, turn-in date quite yet. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't know if you read The Chelsea Girls by Fiona Davis, but she yes, writes during that time period too, which is a fun, a fun time to read, uh, read about. Um, okay. Does anyone have any other questions or any other comments that you would have for Kate? Um, we have a few uh, comments. There are definitely the lot of momentum for this being a, a movie. Uh, both Barbara and Amy feel like Definitely, this would be great. Barbara saying it's impossible not to keep visualizing the film version. Um, and Barbara also saying that she can totally see The Huntress as a miniseries, and it's one of her favorite books of all time. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Well, thank um, you, everybody, for inviting me to join you. This has been such fun. Um, thanks again, and thank you for reading. I hope as well, and I hope you all have, have a lovely rest of your night. Thank you so much for being here. It's really wonderful to speak with you. All right, everybody have a good night. A real pleasure. Take Thank care. you so much, Kate.